Welcome to the second video for the Backbone example for the full stack JavaScript book. In this example, I will show you how to uh, attach some event listeners. So, in other words, it's event binding in Backbone. jQuery is good for event listeners, but it's not really good for organizing those events. So what we have here, this is our Apple view. If you remember from the previous video, this is the individual view of the Apple. And uh, usually we want to put our event listeners in the initialize. So this way uh, we are ready for when the event actually happens to catch those events. So the first thing that happens with a class or an object is the initialize will be called. And that's where we want to put our event listeners. So what we have here, model on change, that will basically trigger the render method every time there is a change. So the syntax is very simple. You use dot on on a model or in a view or in a collection. Backbone is very flexible. Then first argument is the name change. Second argument is the function that you want to call when this event happens. And the third, it's optional, it's a context. So we want to pass this view to the render. Let's look at the spinner event. This is a event I came up with. It's not a system event. So there are certain events that Backbone will fire, for example, change and uh, the way it works, I trigger it manually over here in the load Apple. So what it will do, it will call show spinner and show spinner will replace the body HTML with a spinning image. Why would do that? Because usually there is a lag between when you submit a request and when you get the response from the server. Usually it's fast. Hopefully it's fast, but oftentimes it's not. So in this case, I simulate the delay. I put set timeout with one second, which is quite a long time for the response, but still. Maybe we have a bad internet connection. So set timeout will delay our function for one second. And the function in the callback is the view.model.set. So this set setting will trigger the change. The change will call the render and the render will replace HTML, which before had the spinner, with apples from this template. And if you remember, the template is basically an image and a caption. Okay, so let's see how it works in real life. Need the server. You can go to the browser, the URL is slash binding and then slash hashtag apples slash Fuji or Gala. Click enter, wait for one second and we see the image and the caption. So it works. Let's move on to another example with subviews. In this example, what we want to do, we want to create some subviews. Views can have multiple nested views and they're called subviews. The syntax for subviews is the same, it's just a view. But the logic behind it is that you want to encapsulate, you want to separate the individual Apple view and the view for the list. So in this case, the list view is our home view. And then we have this collection, collection.each. It's a backbone method which iterates through collection one item at a time, one model at a time. And each time we create a new Apple item view, we're passing the model, which is an Apple, then we're rendering it and appending the result to our list. List EL, it's a dash, it's a dot apples dash list. So what we should see, we should see a list of images inside of a JSON output. Let's go ahead and see how it works. Okay. So this individual subview, it has a name of an apple. So if you go there, we click on the location. It opens in a new window. And then 
It also has the buy button, which puts it in a cart. So this is a virtual shopping cart. So it tells you how many apples of which kind you put it here. If you go back to the editor, you would see this dot cart dot box. This is our shopping cart element. And the way it works, there is a method add to cart in the subview. So subview has its own set of elements. And when you click on add to cart, this is the backbone convention, how you would define events. Add to cart is triggered when we click on that buy button. So this comes from each individual subview. The good thing about this logic and this organization is that individual subview, in this case Apple item view, knows uh, all the model information about its context. So all we need to do, we just pass this dot model to the add to cart function. This way we don't need to keep track of uh, IDs of the names of prices etc. Everything is stored in the subview. So subview has each subview has its own model. If you do it without subviews, then you have to store this information somewhere, probably in the DOM, which is not good. We don't want our DOM to become a, a database. Let's move to the next example. Probably you've seen that our file grew quite long. That's why so refactoring is a good idea. So what I did, I just separated views and subviews and uh, templates into separate files. And then I included them using script tags. So as you can see, didn't change much, except that each file becomes very small. It's very nice. It's a good way to organize backbone code and just any gener code in general. You want to have uh, your files as granular as possible. So one problem with this is that script is a blocking tag. So each file will, has to wait for the previous file to load, even when they're not depending on each other. A good way to reorganize this would be to use something like AMD which stands for Asynchronous Module Definition, or a library to implement AMD, it's called require. So what we do, we import require, and then we import just one single file compared to a whole bunch of files, right? This approach is way, way better. And then in this file, we list what we depend on. So we list our views, we list our templates, and the syntax is required, then the string, and then the objects. So the order here matters. So for example, uh, item number four, apple.template, will become the fourth item. So just keep in mind that the order must follow exactly the same sequence that you had in the first array. And then you have your code. So AMD and RequireJS is smart. They will load all the dependencies for you asynchronously, which is also, it reduces the waiting time for users. And then once you're ready to go to production, you would use require to minify everything and to build your files. So instead of a lot of different files, now you're back to one file but that file will be minified. So this is the minified file. It doesn't even have line ends, just everything jumbled up. And uh, as you can see in index, we require just one file. Why it's better? Because uh, there's overhead when you request a new file. So if you need to request 10 files, that's usually slower, even if it's asynchronous, it's usually slower than requesting one file. So in production, you want to have just one file and uh, send it to CDN, cache it somewhere. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the backbone chapter of uh, the full stack JavaScript. See you in the next video.